Dr. Carson, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I think the best way to start before we delve into your book is to delve into you. Sure. So tell me, you have a, a, a very inspirational uh, story in many ways, how you grew up. Tell me where you grew up. I uh, grew up in Detroit mm -hmm. and uh, a couple of years in Boston also. You know, my, uh, my mother uh, came from a large rural family, got married when she was 13. From where? In, in from Detroit? rural Tennessee. Rural Tennessee, okay. And she and my father moved uh, to Detroit. He was a factory worker. Some years later, she discovered he was a bigamist. And uh, wow. she had the responsibility at that point with only a third grade education of trying to raise us on her own. How many of you were there? Uh, myself and my brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, we weren't particularly good students. Uh, and that's putting it mildly. I was, I was the dummy. That's what everybody called Boy, me. Boy, a neurosurgeon <laughs> now, and you're the dummy. I was so, the dummy. All right, that's it, what I've been wanting to get to. It's like, how do you got from the dummy to neurosurgeon? But let's stay with let's Well, stay with everybody about. used to tease me and call me names. But, you know, my mother, and, and I, I think any success I've had, you know, I have to contribute to God and my mother. Mm -hmm. um, she, she was always seeking wisdom and, and came up with the idea of opening your eyes and looking around you. And mm -hmm. she noticed that the homes that she cleaned, People didn't watch a lot of TV, no offense, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and they read a lot of books. Yeah. And, you know, she looked at where we lived, she looked at where they lived, and somehow it clicked in her mind, if I can get my boys to stop just looking at TV all day long and start reading. And uh, she imposed that on us. Yeah. What, what were you obsessed with with television? Did you have a favorite TV show back then? Uh, I, just, I loved anything. Yeah. Just <laughs> you know, whatever was glowing, huh? You didn't need a TV guide if I was around. Yeah. I could tell you what was on every station. Wow. But, um, you know, she basically restricted us to two or three TV programs mm -hmm. per week. Wow. And with all that spare time, said we had to read two books apiece from the Detroit Public Libraries and submit to her written book reports. No kidding. Which she couldn't read, but we didn't know she couldn't read them. You didn't know that? She would put little check marks and When did and you find out that your mom stuff. couldn't read? Uh, later on in high school. That's interesting. So, in fact, uh, she got her GED the same year I graduated from high school. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. And, uh, but... Mm -hmm. But anyway, you know, by making us read, uh, which I hated, uh, something happened. I used to admire the smart kids in the class. Mm -hmm. I was always saying, how come they know all the answers? They're the same age as I am. But as I started reading, all of a sudden a teacher would ask a question, you and I knew the answer. You had an answer. And it, it got me excited. And I got to the point where, you know, if I had five minutes, I was reading a book. I went from being the dummy to the top of the class in a year and a half. Give me the first book that you really sort of said. So for me, for instance, I read- Chip my, the Dam Builder. Yeah, okay, because my, my dad made me read Profiles in Courage in yeah. eighth grade, yeah. and I was like, oh, and that's what got sparked me some interest in politics. So no, what was it for this you? This was in the fifth grade, yeah. Chip the Dam Builder. Okay. It was about a beaver, but he was a cool beaver, I gotta yeah. tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, I went on from there, and read every animal book in the Detroit Public Library. And then I started reading about plants, and then mm -hmm. I started reading about rocks because we lived near the railroad tracks and there were all these rocks and I would get, get boxes mm -hmm. of rocks and pretty soon I could identify any rock. And so suddenly you were a scientist and you didn't realize it. I didn't realize uh, it. So that now I'm starting to make the connection here. Exactly. So you, that's, that maybe sparked your interest in science? Well, one day the science teacher held up a big black shiny rock. He said, does anybody know what this is? And of course, I, I didn't raise my hand because I, I never raised my hand. Mm -hmm. And nobody raised their hand so I raised my hand, everybody turned around, they couldn't believe. They said, oh, this is going to be hilarious, right. you know. Were you known as a jokester or something? They thought you were <laughs> Well, no, they just, they knew that I couldn't possibly know the answer, so it was going to be something really dumb. And uh, I said, it's obsidian. And everybody was, they didn't know whether they should be laughing or whether they should be impressed. And right. finally, the teacher said, that's right. And then I explained how obsidian was formed, and they were just shocked. But I was more shocked than anybody, because it dawned on me at that moment, but I wasn't stupid. And the teacher invited me to come. What grade is this, by the way? Fifth grade. Okay. Teacher invited me to come to the lab, wanted to start a rock collection with me, got me involved in taking care of the little animals. I started looking through the microscope, discovering the whole world of protozoa. Do you remember this teacher's name? Mr. Jake. You never forget, do you? I always say that. that one, there's always that one or two teachers that Absolutely. you know took that little extra interest. No question And you about never it. forget their names. And how long ago is this now? Oh, my. Well, Fifth that grade. was you know, more than 50 years yeah. ago. And, you still and the interesting thing is I went back to uh, that school, and this was several years ago with Good Morning America, mm -hmm. and they wanted to sort of trace my roots, and yeah. Mr. Jake was still there. Is that right? 
balding and pot belly now, but <laughs> still, all right. he was still there. We all at some point. And, and I wanted him uh, to show them the animals because he had a red squirrel, tarantula, Jack Dempsey fish, crayfish, all these things. He said, oh, we, we had to get rid of those things a long time ago. Do you have a relationship with your father? Uh, not a strong relationship. Uh, we would see him periodically. The last time I saw him was the day I got married, 39 years he ago. He came? Yes. Did this second family that he had, do you have a relationship with those half-brothers, half-sisters? No. Not, not at all? No. That's something. Do you, you ever forgive him? Oh, absolutely. But, you know, the, I, I kind of look at the big picture. You know, my mother tried to make up for all that. Mm -hmm. And my father, you know, he was involved with drugs, alcohol, women. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with women, but you can't have more than one. Okay, right. that's a problem. So, <laughs> and that probably would not have been the best influence on me. Right. So in retrospect, even though I was devastated as a kid, yeah. I was always praying, let them come back, let them come back. Now I realize that perhaps that would not have been the best thing for me. Detroit today, what would you be doing to fix Detroit? Uh, well, uh, first of all, w the same thing that I would be doing to fix almost any place. Mm -hmm. uh, bring back some fiscal responsibility, fiscal common sense. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, a lot of people blame the unions for what happened to Detroit. Um, but I, I actually don't blame the unions. Unions do what unions do. And they would gladly strangle the goose that laid the golden egg. Just for a golden egg, give me the egg. That's all they want. But, you know, the... Well, they're the, representing their members and their members want a better deal. Yeah. Right. But, but you know, the, the executives in the big three auto companies, now they have a one-year, five-year, 10-year, 15-year plan. They understand all that. And they knew that if they kept conceding to the union, mm -hmm. that eventually there would be a problem. But they kept doing it anyway because they knew that they would have their golden parachute and be long gone before. And that would be somebody else's problem. It'd be somebody so you really you, you blame as much the executives as you do sort of. And, well, it's the same same thing I see around the country. Yeah. We keep let it be somebody else's problem. Right. You know, when you you have gotten this spark of, of enthusiasm among conservatives mm -hmm. uh, of, of recent, have you been surprised that it's come from conservatives? Have you been did you did you assume you were a conservative when you did this? Because I get the impression you weren't always a conservative in no. your mind. No, well, obviously, like most young people, you know, growing up in a place like Detroit, you know, mm -hmm. when I went off to college, I was radical. Yeah. You know? Where'd you go to school? I went to Yale. Yeah. Uh, so which what is, is a radical at Yale, though? I mean, you know, <laughs> let's say, there is degrees, you know, radical, if you told me radical at Berkeley, <laughs> I'd know what you're, radical at Yale, you know. They, they, they had their share of radicals. I understand, yeah. There was the Black Panther rally, uh -huh. you know, Kingman Brewster was evil, you know, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, but it was, it was just, just the way it was at that time mm -hmm. uh, during our history. And radicalism was very much accepted among young people at that point. But, you know, I consider myself really more of a, a logical person than I am a conservative or a liberal or anything. I, I'm not all that fond of labels. But I say most of our problems are easily solvable if we could just throw away the labels. Mm -hmm. You know, I indicated in the book I would love a situation where party designation was not on the ballot. Yeah. Where you had to actually know who that person was. You know, you in, most, know in a lot of cities... Yeah. For mayor's races, that's the case. That that is the case, and it's not surprising to me. Guess who's getting stuff done these days? Mayors. Yeah. You know, they don't have the baggage that comes with a political party right now in mm -hmm. some of these cities. So it's an interesting thing. Yeah, absolutely. So you go to Yale, and when did you decide, I'm going to be a doctor? Well, I had actually decided that when I was eight years old. Is that right? I, I used to love the mission stories in church and Sabbath school. They frequently featured missionary doctors who seemed like the most noble people on the face of the earth. Great personal sacrifice, bringing mental, physical, and spiritual healing to people. And I said, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, but when I turned 13, having grown up in dire poverty, I decided yeah. I'd rather be rich. So at that point, I wanted to be a psychiatrist. <laughs> so you decided a psychiatrist was a way to make better money than a doctor? Well, on television, you know, they drove Jaguars, they lived in the big fancy mansions and had these plush offices. Who were the psychiatrists that you referred to? I don't know. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, most of the TV programs where you would see a psychiatrist, you they thought, were. Well, they're, they're, the, they're doing it, huh? I they're said, living it. This is they're pretty cool. Large. And I started reading psychology today. Mm -hmm. Everybody would bring me their problems. I sit down and say, mm, okay. Lucy, <laughs> Lucy and Nickel, did you hang a sign out exactly. there? Five signs. And I majored in psychology in college. Uh -huh. and 
you know, had luminary uh, professors like Anna Freud and 